I'm Kid Ann Renee. You need no more proof that we are living smack dab in the beating heart of the global village than this. A wire running underneath the city and connected to your house lets you watch the evening news in Russia, a rocket launch from France, or your son's high school football game at the mere push of a button aimed at a box in your living room. What does a technology overload of the last 20 years say about us? What has it done to us? Is modern man the same person he was 100 years ago, 50, or even 30? To help us understand these questions and so much more are Dr. Timothy Leary and from the Marshall McLuhan Center on Global Communications, Nelson Thal and Bob Marshall. These are huge questions. And frankly, who's to say whether they or anyone else has the answers? But barring any strange gaps in the time-space continuum, we'll try to sort them out for you right here. Keep your finger off that button. This is 2830. Timothy Leary is a true visionary. He's been heralded as possessing one of the most progressive minds of this century. You know his name, but what does that make you think of? Drugs, the 60s, acid trips. If that's what comes to your mind, check your calendar. A lot has been going on since then. While you were growing up, Timothy Leary has been thinking. Please welcome. Dr. Timothy Leary. Great, great pleasure to be here on uh, 2830. A lot of people know you, and you're very legendary from the 60s, and I'm sure the audience would like to know what you've been up to lately. Well, basically, uh, I am a psychologist, and I had a quite a good reputation as a world-influential philosopher before the year 1960 when I got involved in experimenting with psychedelic drugs at Harvard University. So, uh, by the way, when you talk about drugs, I have never had anything to do with heroin or cocaine or the most dangerous drugs of all, the legal drugs like prescription drugs. Uh, I've only uh, experimented with so-called psychedelic or mind-opening drugs. And when you experimented with them during that period of time, they were legal? They were legal, yeah. Mm -hmm. We uh, suddenly, by uh, act of law, we became, uh, instead of being uh, respected scientists, we became criminals. <laughs> did that, that change? That, that makes life exciting. I, did that change? Was that a turning point in your life? Well, it sure did. Yes. Uh, uh, to have the, for years, the FBI and the DEA and the narcotic people were on my tail. It was like a, a terrible B movie uh, because I was a uh, used as a symbol uh, or as a spokesperson for a global movement which was, was going to happen whether I was there or not, but uh, I was articulate enough and uh, I was kind of a target for it and I, uh, I take no credit or blame. People say to me, uh, you ruined an entire generation of 76 million people. Oh, wow, that's, that, that's, a, lot, that's a lot of hard work. Uh, and only about 30 million of them had the politeness to, uh, to thank me for it. Uh, what, what did you learn from that period of time experimenting with these drugs? Number one, these psychedelic plants uh, like LSD, peyote, mushrooms have been used for thousands of years in uh, tribes where the shamanic or the medicine people or the prophets would use them for religious uh, purposes. Those tribes were lucky enough either through geography or climate where they grew. But what happened in the 1960s because of uh, jet travel because of uh, global television, radio, network, because of rock and roll records, suddenly something that had been going on for thousands of years became uh, the center of, of worldwide attention. And that's, uh, I'm a psychologist, and what I'm always interested in, I want to learn more about how to operate my mind and how to operate my brain. And through Brett, Timothy Leary came down, and um, one of Timothy Leary's big ideas is the space migration idea which is really sort of a meditative idea it was great to get him down and um, we were able to use some of what he was saying in front of a song called Venus which is very much about space traveling virtual reality holds a key to the evolution of the human mind with a vision of the future the virtual reality simply means electronic reality or digital reality and uh, there's nothing very magical about it do you know that the average American today and this is a spooky, spooky thought. 
watches television seven hours a day. Now that's, that's, they're watching an electronic make-believe make reality uh, made of clusters of uh, photons and electrons and beamed into your home while we sit like slugs in amoeba having our brains programmed. Our minds are being formatted by the electrical uh, signals being sent. Are there health hazards involved with virtual reality? Well, the same uh, health hazards that are involved in watching a computer screen would occur if you're watching an electronic screen. Of course, you're a little closer to the uh, uh, screen. Uh, brains love electrons, just like your body has to have proteins and carbohydrates and your lungs need air. Brains are starved for light, and all we're talking about is illumination, electricity, uh, telephones, which put us in, in, in touch with each other. And now uh, the new computer type devices will be photonic. So basically, uh, uh, electrons are good for you, but don't get addicted to them. So you don't think people will become addicted to it, in other I don't words? Think so, no. You know, and anyway, there's this, this myth, total exploitive myth about the very word addiction. Uh, people that get addicted, and they're sure you can get addicted to food, you can get addicted to television, you can get addicted to. Uh, Ecstasy. Yeah. Are people that don't have anything else interesting to do. The idea is to smarten up, operate your mind, keep active. If I get out of bed, the first thing I don't want to do is uh, rush into a computer uh, artificial reality. I've got things to do. Addicted people are people with low self-esteem that don't have anything more interesting to do than, uh, and you get people that are addicted to their diseases. I mean, and they're inventing a new disease a week now because there's incredible industries that uh, uh, you're addicted to love or you're a codependency or you're addicted why do nice men like me marry bad women like you all that it's all being you're addicted to yourself yeah so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but the, but you said something very interesting you said that we have to learn to control our own minds now virtual reality though aren't those are there programmers actually writing those programs that create the reality that a person interacts with present time, what you're talking about is something like the Air Force will have uh, uh, simulations so that you're in a, uh, uh, like a pilot and suddenly there's an artificial environment that has been created to, uh, to help you fly your way through it. Um, what I do is designed to empower the individual to uh, use this equipment actively and don't sit like a passive slug. Okay, Dr. Leary, what about cyber sex and uh, relationships? There will be some people that will use this ability to communicate uh, uh, at the speed of light for sexual purposes. In here we can be anything we want to be. I'll see you on the inside. Hello, Dr. Leary. Hello, Dr. Leary. Now, how will it work? I read that you don the gloves, you don uh, a, a cyber suit. I mean, what is this feely technology? That, that is, uh, that's not going to be done. If some people do it. There'll probably be arcades where you can go in and plug in the half, uh, 50 cents, put yourself in a suit, and you have someone else in, in, in Toronto who's kind of doing this with their hand, and you'll see, and you'll be feely it here, or, or, or doing this, or mm, like that. Uh, uh, it's a novelty. How do you envision the year 2000? Well, I see the, the, the next century as number one, um, Marshall McLuhan's vision of a, of a global village will be linked up this way, not with goggles, but with just plain old screen. They're plain old eyeballs. Yeah. Eyeballs. And um, it's also going to be the, 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 the millennium, or less of the century, the 21st century is going to be the century of women and children. Uh, the most exciting thing that's happened in the, in the 90s is that uh, suddenly the issue of, 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 of human, it's not, I'm not talking feminism, it's humanism. And, uh, and above all, we're aware of the fact that at the bottom of the pile are children. The neglect, the abuse, uh, the uh, uh, disregard for kids, uh, 
And that's going to change. You got to learn how to operate your own soul, operate your own brain, find other souls and brains that you can communicate with. Uh, yeah, I uh, would say it's going to be the, uh, the century of humanism. Right. <laughs> I think the smarter people get, uh, the more human they are, the more open-minded they are. See, I love to be proven wrong, because I, I learn something. I hate it if I'm right all the time, and I'm considered a smart ass, and no one wants to talk with me. I love it when there's a new, new viewpoint. Most of us who came of age in the 60s and 70s know Marshall McLuhan for his groundbreaking book, Understanding Media, which we all claimed we read in college. My first teaching job was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And when I got up to face freshman classes there, I realized I was in a, a strange country and that I had to learn a good deal about it from the very ground up. I began to study their popular culture as a way of setting up a more natural dialogue with my students. That is, I began to study the sports, the humor, the comics, and it was literally while studying the New Yorker and Time that I hit upon the discovery that if you don't understand these everyday things that are absolutely basic part of uh, our lives, it's rather futile to um, be teaching Wordsworth and Matthew Arnold and even Dr. Johnson that if you can't even grasp the nature of your own world, why spend your time studying somebody else's world? Today, Marsha McLuhan's revolutionary theories about communications live on in the persons of Nelson Thal and Bob Marshall from the McLuhan Center on Global Communications. Marshall's messages still ring true today as these modern day mediums will explain. Could you give me an idea, or very briefly, of a history and the purpose of the center? The center was uh, started by uh, McLuhan's daughter, Mary McLuhan, who is the chairperson to this day. And uh, basically the purpose of the center is to carry on uh, as much as possible the, uh, the work of M Dr. McLuhan. Uh, from a standpoint of uh, giving awards out to distinguished teachers. McLuhan, we must remember, was an English professor at the University of Toronto, but also to carry on within a think tank organization a group of consultants who were around McLuhan working with him to continue that body of discovery and research, and then we try and interpolate it for the businessman and apply it to the everyday world. Mm -hmm. So, in short, you, there's a think tank operation, and Bob, I believe, aren't you in charge of that? Yes, I'm the one who's had the longest experience with Marshall in, uh, among the consultants we use, and so I'm sort of the organizer of new percepts and new uh, theories that we can advise to our consultants. Just out of curiosity, what do you consult the Fortune 500 companies about? All businessmen are selling the same product, widgets, and we deal with businessmen's problems. So basically what we do is we get together with the businessmen and we dialogue with them about their problems which is, and we spend a lot of time educating businessmen. We uh, talk to them about uh, uh, learning to dialogue about their problems in order to perceive what their real problems are because most businesses don't even know what business they're in. Uh, by that I mean McLuhan often talked about how the Bell Telephone Company didn't understand what business it was in. They didn't realize they were in the information transfer business. They thought they were in the business of putting a piece of hardware wired up between homes in your around in the, in the society. They didn't think of it as being we're in the information transfer business. The answer and solution to every problem lies within the problem. The key is once you define your problem, what the problem actually is first. Right. Then the businessmen themselves will see many different possible solutions. They just need sort of a, what in computer terms, a bootstrap loader just to get them going. How successful is the center in, in creating the results? Well, we're sort of like uh, intelligence organizations that uh, we uh, can't talk about our success. So we don't talk a lot about the business we do. But we have been, uh, we've been very helpful for, for, some, for many different businesses. And uh, we're batting a 1,000. OK. Well, I guess we're going to talk about technology now, okay, Terrific. because that's why we, we are here. Yeah. And uh, my question to you is, are we being dehumanized 
by the technology? Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is uh, in many cases we are, uh, but we need not be dehumanized. Uh, technology, all technology are extensions of some part of our body. The hammer is an extension of the fist, the knife is an extension of the teeth, uh, uh, the clothes are an extension of the skin, and city walls, the old city walls were an extension of the collective skin. Today, we have this new form of technology, which is electric technology, which is extension uh, is an extension of our central nervous system. And we have literally put our inside central nervous system, the core of our being, the inside of that spine, that electric technology, and we've put it outside ourselves as the final uh, extension. And, that is uh, a problem because it ha never happened before in the history of the 20th century and we just don't know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. So did we do that in earlier times, in earlier societies? Did we, did we project what you said our nervous systems are projected outside of ourselves? <clears throat> no, it's only with electric technology that we have now reached uh, extending the central nervous system. Prior to that, we had extended other parts of our body, but they were all non-electric. Mm -hmm. So, so in other words, we're exposed. We're Is that totally what you're exposed. saying? We're, we're without our skin. We're walking around without our skin, and we're without our bodies. Because when you're on the air or on the phone, you're discarnate. You have no body. And when you have no body, you have no identity. But wait a moment. I have a body, and <clears> I'm <throat> sitting here. But That's right. You're sitting here, but you're not right now on the phone. And you're not on the air. We're not going live right now. We're going to tape. So technically, you're discarnate in that it's going into a can, into a machine in the other room. You're discarnate within the room, but you're not discarnate totally around the planet. What does the word discarnate actually mean? Discarnate means without your body. Without we are your without body. our body. And when you're on the phone, you're in a space. If you try and think about the space of the movies, the space of dreams, the space of being on the phone is something that you cannot visualize. Because when I pick up the phone and I'm in Toronto and I talk to you, uh, I'm now making decisions in Los Angeles. And you're in Toronto. And the user of the technology is sent. The user is the content. And you're sent. And therefore, you're without your body. And this is something that has never happened before in the history of mankind. The, um, the Greek world, for thousands of years, had organized itself on oral lines of communication, the tribal encyclopedia. And the Homer's, Homeric songs, the Bardic songs, captured all the information relevant to the society in order to survive. How to cook, how to hunt, how to do all the things was latent within the language. When the phonetic alphabet came along, you could now codify the acoustic word into visual space and led to the destruction of the Greek civilization because now everything could be coded into visual form. And immediately, as soon as the alphabet came in, boom, Plato shouted, throw the poets out of the educational establishment. Because up until the phonetic alphabet, the point of the phonetic alphabet, the poets were the teachers. As soon as you had the phonetic alphabet and books were called teaching machines, you now could replace the poet with the book. It became the new teacher. OK, so now, now, we're now what's re replacing the we're, book now? We're playing the tape backwards. We now have had 3,500 years of literacy. And now we're embracing electronic technology, which is completely or oral. It's it, oral. It's completely oral in it's, its form. In the sense that it's simultaneous. In the sense that it's simultaneous. It's simultaneous. It, once again, we experience everything together. Simultaneously, we share Mr. Clinton's trips around the world. Wh whatever. Wait a minute. Only the few people that happen to watch that particular newscast, the stuff that's on uh, computer disks, the stuff that's on tapes, CDs, it's not simultaneous. Digital stuff you can do it anytime you want, and uh, you're in charge of the time, and you can hook up and do it with other people. You no, know, the uh, the simultaneity refers to the resonating sphere of the television environment, not the content. The fact. Oh, that now we get into the res resonating sphere division. Yeah. Oh, wow! <laughs> <laughs> you guys are in serious trouble. <laughs> well, dig your way out of that one. Well, <laughs> resonating. Resonating. Yeah. You better resonate. Let's watch well. these. 
<laughs> Come on. The pyramid, the pyramid, the pyramid, the pyramid bu bureaucratic sure. pyramidal organization is obsolete by the 360 degree sphere of the resonating acoustic space. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. that was awfully fast. <laughs> that was a buzz of electric. Yeah. <laughs> that was fitting okay. its wig. All right. Uh, uh, right. The one air now the other. Consciousness is retrieved with electric technology. Uh, Dr. Leary, when Sputnik created Beatnik, when the Sputnik went around the planet and turned the planet into a stage. Yeah. That's a fast yeah. Yeah. Black and white TV. They won the World Series with curveballs. Oh, yeah. When, when the Sputnik went around the planet, turning the, creating a resonating sphere, turning the planet into a stage, we all became actors. That it, that effect on us had if influenced Don't say people. We all keep you be out of your Toronto. Oh, he's not talking his personal point of view. No, I know you talking about I'm, the environment you share. Sure. Me, I'm yes, not giving. I'm you, not giving you. No, this is. I like it or not. We wear, wear these environments. No, 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 we no. all wear them, whether we own them or not. No. Okay, but the what, you, so, like Woo, wait, Okay, but the point I, is, you're I, trying to say that now we we live in collectivity. Is this what you're trying to say? We're collective. The the human tribe now experiences simultaneously everything at the same time, even though one person may not have his TV on to watch the space shuttle shot, the entire tribe as a body politic, as a collective body, is involved in it. It, it, every, it's person, it's like every, every person every every person doesn't have to be drive. every person doesn't have to be actually aware of it. Yeah, well, you know, we have taken our eyes and ears and nerves and put them up on the satellites. And what these satellites really represent is the collective eyes and ears and nerves of our entire nation, of our entire tribe, since there are no nations. But, the, but our, when we put our eyes and ears and nerves and hand them over to private corporations as a monopoly, this is like handing the atmosphere over to a private corporation as a monopoly, and you just get a bill in the mail at the end of the month saying you had so many inhalations and exhalations and you owe us so much money. What rights do you have left when you live in that? So we handed out, we handed outer space over to a private corporation as a monopoly. It was called NASA. And what we have now is we've handed our collective eyes and ears and nerves to private corporations. And when you do that, if I can control what you see and hear and feel, I can make the world turn in whatever tempo I choose. So you think you're looking at reality, but you're in my theater without walls, the global theater. But that's a genuine fake. The content that they control and pretend to control, which is based on the pollster guys, the audience polls, those that is a fake dictatorship. That is post-1984. It, it looks like 1984, but they don't, they don't control the tactile mesh effect of television okay. on your central nervous system. All right, so we're talking about control. So whom are we talking about who's in control? Well, we let I guess the, the, the owner, Nielsen ratings are the, the Nielsen control. Ratings, the owners of the system. Mm -hmm. the, the owners, managers, no, the, not the, yeah, the man, not the owners. The owners the, the collapsed managers, in 1929. Yeah. The managers, the managers took over in the 30s, and advertising took over in the 40s, and the Nielsen ratings have been running the, the mixed corporate media on the big scale, but they don't control people mm -hmm. anymore, and that's why we have what is called the chaotic universe. Mm -hmm. What the about the large science. families? What yeah. about some of the, the major families in the world? I mean, you're talking about control. Well, they can't control mm -hmm. it. The Queen's just decided to pay taxes. Yeah. The electric age can either be bought, sold, or stolen. Yeah. We really, there's no one at the switchboard. We have created a, 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 um, a mammoth hybrid monster of technology that has put us all into servitude, and we are, it's on autopilot, and we're really uh, all crew on a, on a plane where the plane's on autopilot and the door to the cockpit is locked, <laughs> and we're all scrambling to try and get it, find a way to get into the cockpit. Now, and no I one's come up with a way to get into it yet. That, do you really believe that battle? See, one thing this is my final. I, no, I, I believe is not a point. It's what it uh, evokes. It evokes perceptions right, of new making, right. new new challenges. Uh, right. yeah. We're not. We're, we're, just, thing, we're, we're not giving about, about, about McLuhan. What's that? One thing to remember about yeah. Mark McLuhan is he had a sense of humor. Yes. There was a twinkle in his eye, and he would throw these little things out. Uh, I'm the twinkle. He's the uh, mouth. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Keep the sense of humor. Marshall's telling me right now, keep it light, boys. You know, well, I'm doing that. Bounce it around yeah. here. Let's not get the... Uh, well, we're <laughs> bouncing it. Wait. 
you know, a crew of a plane that's going to chaos, hell to hell, whether you like it or not, with chaos at the control, good. I want to be on it. <laughs> but yeah, Dr. Leary, when you were in the other room, they were talking about virtual reality. Now, you were saying that virtual, they were saying that virtual reality is something that can save us, that can keep us in control. W weren't you saying something to that effect? No, no. I Did was, I understand oh, you correctly? I was saying, yes, it does give identity to the new generation, the new breed, 1992 to 2012. They get a sense of private identity. They can retrieve some of it through the interactive media because the content is interactive and can be visualized and played with. It's almost left hemisphere artifacts, images and that. Now, the cyber suits are something different. That's where you get kinetic and you're swimming. But as he pointed out, that's a minor part of virtual reality. The interactiveness the, restores private identity. But we still have the instantaneous transfer of funds electric symbolism or electric money going around causing inflation in all countries which is the collective we that we are all doing to ourselves the self invasion that still affects people's lives so you have these generations these new generations the last 20 years finding it hard to find a job that's caused by the electric media that's a disservice but it can be balanced off by the information exchange that Dr. Leary is talking about so in other words there are good things and bad things service Same old story. Dis we don't use the word good and bad good we talk about service and disservice effects yeah we're not giving our opinions here. We're merely objective observers who are reporting what we see. And we're saying you can bounce a ball off it, and you can take a look and see whether you see the same thing. Because if it's there, if the iceberg is below the surface, then a uh, the patterns will Watch begin to show. Now we got an iceberg out there. This guy. Is <laughs> well, the, well yeah. the, iceberg the iceberg is a great <laughs> metaphor because people only see. Siberia, the, the iceberg. I'll take the iceberg. Iceberg. The rocks, okay? The iceberg's a good metaphor. Siberia, cold environment. We're going to have to close this in a minute, I've been told, director. And I'd like to join. Uh, it's a great honor to have, for me to have you guys. Well, it's a terrific house. honor for us, Dr. Leary. I am a total dedicated uh, worshiper of uh, McLuhan's ideas. Uh, I'm proud that we're here laughing and joking and making fun of each other because he'd love it. Yep. Here's to you, Marshall, and keep, keep us all going. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 28.30, all the way. <laughs>